Aromaticity, the concept of aromaticity, and substitution reactions. Now, benzene is an interesting compound with an interesting history if you're an organic chemist. Uh, formula is C6H6. Um, if you do degrees of unsaturation, that's four. So you would think it would have double bonds. Um, it does not, however, react with HCl like every other alkene in the world does. Nor does it react with bromine and carbon tet. And the reduction with hydrogen on platinum surface is very, very slow. So no reaction, no reaction, and very slow. Now, if you let this sit long enough, you do, in fact, get cyclohexane. So that kind of suggests that it is a six-membered ring and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Back before there were things like x-ray crystallography and stuff like that, chemists had to do things the hard way. And one of the hard ways was to do something called heat of hydrogenation. So this is thermodynamics. If you start with cyclohexene and go to cyclohexane, you can measure a delta H. In this case, it's close to 30 kilocals per mole. <coughs> Now, if you do a diene, again, back to cyclohexane, you get just about double that. So that's a nice trend. You would expect that if benzene had three double bonds going to cyclohexane, it should be about 86. In fact, it's only about 50. So there's 36 kilocals per mole missing. It's more stable. Now, in the day, this was a great controversy. Chemists just really got angry at each other and stuff like that. And there were lots and lots of structures suggested. Um, this is a notable one. This is a dual benzene. This was Kekulé benzene with the three double bonds. Here's a cute thing with two cyclopropene <coughs> rings. And this guy down here, we call this prismane. Um, in those days, this was put forth by Landenberg, and this was Landenberg's version of benzene. All of these you would expect to undergo some reaction with HCl or bromine or whatever, except this one. So this was kind of a cute one to consider. So let's consider. Kekulé and Ladenburg. Kekulé had suggested this, a six-membered ring with three double bonds, and the alternative was prismate, really cute compound. Um, C6A6, once again, no double bonds. That would explain a lot. One of the things that they were good at doing in those days was reacting stuff to get various numbers of isomers. Now, I said bromine would not react with benzene by itself, but it will react with bromine if you put in a Lewis acid. And if you do that, you can isolate three dibromo isomers. Now, Kekulé, in his structure, would come up with a total of four. <coughs> Here we have two bromines with a single bond in between, double bond in between, one three and one four. Uh, the difference in these two, if you think about it, single bond is longer than a double bond, so they should be isomeric. Now, Ladenberg benzene, in fact, can only get three isomers. So poor Kekulé was really depressed. Then one evening, the story goes, um, in some sort of a drunken stupor, uh, it came to him, sitting in front of the fire, that what was really happening was that you had these guys, but they were rapidly flipping back and forth. And therefore, these were the same isomer. 
Now, we know that this is not true these days. Kekulé was right. It is a six-membered ring with three double bonds. But, in fact, this is not a dynamic feature where bonds are really flipping back and forth. In fact, we have resonance forms between these two. And we tend to show that using a circle in the middle to indicate that the electrons are totally distributed among all these carbons. Now, benzene is really the champion when it comes to resonance delocalization. Every carbon in the ring has this p orbital sticking up and down. They all overlap very, very nicely. And they form an absolutely beautiful high cloud above and below the plane. And remember, when you look at electrostatic potential maps, uh, red means lots of electrons. Blue means electron deficient. You have this huge pi cloud, again, above and below from this pi system. It's, it's a really neat, really neat thing. All right. Um, as we do every functional group, I like to name them. So we don't have to just talk about this compound and that compound. So we're going to do a little bit on um, benzene nomenclature, stuff like that. Here's a parent compound, benzene. If you put one methyl group on, we'll see we could call this methylbenzene. Um, it is commonly called toluene. <coughs> Anything with one three isomers is given the prefix meta. Here we stick on a nitrogen. This is aniline. Aniline plays a very important part in uh, the history of organic chemistry and its development. But in no way, Sean, this is phenol. This is also called carbolic acid. Um, <coughs> finally, nitro group. This is nitrobenzene. This is the parent for explosives. Let's look at phenol, or carbolic acid. Again, it has a rich history. <coughs> this is the first effective antibiotic to be used in surgery. surgery. <coughs> this was a little sprayer that would send out this mist of phenol. Now, phenol is a fairly toxic compound. You get it on your fingers or something, it just kind of eats the skin away and whatever. But it's really good at killing bacteria, too. Uh, this is a picture of uh, surgery. There's a little sprayer. There's the poor guy. He's wide awake. And they're cutting on him while they spray him with this carbolic acid. The surgeons used to hold their breath while they were cutting, run away, breathe, come back. Um, he had no choice. He had to stay there. Uh, this was Joseph Lister was the guy that developed this. Have you ever heard of Listerine? OK, well, uh, phenol is still used as an antibiotic and stuff like that. If you've ever had a sore throat, poor septic is simply a solution of phenol in water. Anilins. Way back in the 1800s, organic chemistry was just kind of this thing. Um, and then this guy named Perkin took home some stuff from lab, worked in his basement with a friend, and mixing stuff together, this was aniline that he took home, so amino benzene. Um, came up with this compound that rejoices in 3 amino, 2 8 dimethyl 5 phenyl, 7 amino phenyl amino 5 phenazonium chloride. So, this stuff. <coughs> what was unique here was this was bright purple. It had the name Mavi. Would dye cotton and 
it turned it nice and purple. In those days, there was no way to do common dyes. They had to use natural stuff. Perkin made a fortune. The uh, uh, Royal Chemical Society is still called the Perkin Society. So this was the very first in a long series of synthetic dyes, and this basically funded the development of organic chemistry. Now we can take benzenes and stick them together. <clears throat> we did naphthalene in lab <coughs> last week. That's mothballs. And we nitrated it here at the one position. Week before, we used anthracene. And we did a 4 plus 2 cycle addition on the central carbons. Um, if you actually take anthracene and just heat it up by itself, you can do a photochemical 4 plus 4 cycle addition like this, two of them dimerizing together. And this is an eight number ring. 4 plus 4 is 8. Um, it's reversible if the heat is originally found. Um, the unique thing about this is that this double bond in this polycyclic system is extraordinarily reactive. <laughs> Unusually reactive for a benzene. In fact, it reacts like it's really a double bond. It turns out that there is an enzyme system in your body called the cytochrome P450 system that will take oxygen and add it to this double bond. Now it does this in a very nice attempt to detoxify this stuff. This is not soluble in anything except soot. Um, if you happen to be a chimney sweep, um, you get lots of this stuff. And this is a detox mechanism. However, if you get a lot of this accumulated, this is an epoxide. And epoxides are reactive. The thing that this reacts with very nicely is DNA. Now you know that DNA has these quote bases. <clears throat> They're purines and pyrimidines, but they have nucleophilic groups on them, and they can add to an epoxide. When this can react with DNA, you can actually stick this whole benzo-a-pyrene thing here in the middle of all the bases covalently linked to one of the DNA side chains. This is a really bad mutagen. Um, it's the number one mutagen in tobacco smoke, um, which is yet another reason. And it occurs, like I said, <coughs> in um, so, this was actually observed in England over the 1800s. They used to call it something like uh, chimney sweep cancer because these guys would you know, sweep the chimneys, get lots of soot, and then they would die of cancer. It's a, a, a very, very bad carcinogen. This is nice and flat right here, and it just kind of fits in nicely with all the bases. Really bad carcinogen. Other compounds of interest. This is DDT. You've probably heard of DDT. Uh, DDT is the best darn insecticide you'll ever see in your life. My gosh, this stuff kills everything. It does. I still have a bottle of it somewhere. It kills absolutely everything. Almost wiped out the American Eagle, birds, bees, whatever. It really re doesn't kill people, but it's really good at everybody else. Um, these guys actually won a Nobel Prize for developing <coughs> this stuff before they realized just what a bad sort of thing it was. Naturally occurring. This is thyroxin. This is an ionobenzene compound. And this is how iodine is carried in your body from your thyroid. Kind of a cute compound. You can add and remove um, iodine from thyroxin enzymatically. 
Now, simple nomenclature. I said we we're going to do this. We're going to start off with benzene as our parent name. For very simple things, we can just add what's attached. So we have bromobenzene, we have ethylbenzene, we have methylbenzene, but again, these aromatic or these benzene compounds are historic. And so therefore, they have lots and lots of trivial names. This is also called toluene, and that's acceptable by our UPAC. If we have guy substituted, you can either name them using numbers, which is preferred, I think, or historically, ortho, meta, and para. Ortho is 1, 2, meta is 1, 3, and para is 1, 4. Um, everyone will uh, talk about para, meta, and ortho constantly. I will too. Um, but really just think 1, 2, 1, 3, and 1, 4. Uh, this is called para-xylene. Again, dimethylbenzenes are called xylenes. Now, if you have substituents around your ring and you're trying to number it, the rule is you want to generate the lowest possible number sequence, and we're going to assign priorities alphabetically if we have a tie. Fairly simple. We've kind of seen this before way back in cyclohexane or cycloalkane nomenclature. For this guy, we have a chlorine, an ethyl group, and another ethyl. Chlorine would win alphabetically, and so this would be 1, 3, 5, 1, 4, 3, 5, diethyl, benzene. Any questions? I mean, you've done cycloalkanes. This is just kind of grows from it. Uh, finally, if we have more carbons on a side chain than we do in our benzene ring, then the benzene ring becomes a substituent, and we call it a phenyl group. Sometimes you will see a phenyl group, a benzene ring, represented as pH, and that just stands for phenyl. <coughs> this has seven carbons in our chain and a benzene ring. This is one fiddle heptane. So very quickly, let's just name these guys. I know you say, I always throw in some nomenclature because it's easy. It's an easy way to grab half a dozen questions correct. Um, and you will see some on your first exam. Let's look at this guy first. We have three substituents. I have a bromine that's going to win alphabetically. And we have two methyls. Remember, we have to number this to give us our lowest number <coughs> sequence. If we let bromine be number one, our next substituent would be three. Therefore, number one is going to go here and our bromine will be number four. So we're going to call this four bromo, because that comes first alphabetically, and then one, two, dimethyl, benzene. <clears throat> Here we have a methyl and a chlorine. It's a tie. So the chlorine is going to win alphabetically. We're going to let this be carbon 1. And it's going to be a 1, 3 substituent. So 1 chloro, 3 methyl, benzene. Yeah? Do you have to look at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Because that tells you where you start. Here we have a nitro group and we have a methyl group. Alphabetically, we're going to start with our methyl group. So this is going to be 1, 4. Methyl comes first, then nitro. 
one methyl four nitro benzene. Any questions? Remember, we're in fast gear now. Yeah, we have questions. Well, because if bromine was one, our order would be one, three, four. One, three, four loses to one, two. Go for the lowest sequence at the first point of difference. Here we have three guys. We have an ethyl, we have a chlorine, and we have a nitro group. In our name, the chlorine is going to come first, and the ethyl, then the nitro. But numbering, we have to get our lowest sequence. So we're going to start up here. Our chlorine is in 2, our nitro group is in 4, and we can call it 2 chloro. No, yeah, 2 chloro, 1 ethyl, 4 nitro, benzene. Same groups here, we have a chlorine, we have an ethyl, we have a nitro. Once again, we're going to start up here with our chlorine as number one. We'll round the ring this way, so we have a one, two, four. And it's going to be a one chloro, two ethyl, four nitro, benzene. And our last one here, we have a chlorine, an ethyl, and a nitro, just like before. But here we're going to have to generate our lowest number sequence. So we're going to have to start down here with the nitro group at carbon 1. That makes chlorine at 4. So this would be a 4 chloro, 2 ethyl, 1 nitro, benzene. Just remember the rule for the lowest number sequence. Then you arrange your name alphabetically, just like cyclohexanes. Now I said that IUPAC will also let you call these things toluene. So how would you name these as toluene? If you name it as toluene, the methyl group is, by definition, number one. So that makes it really simple. The methyl group is always going to be one. That makes it a 2 chloro 4 nitro toluene. You don't have to indicate where the methyl is because you're calling it a toluene. And that's automatically carbon one. <coughs> Here we have our methyl or chloral or nitro. This is going to be carbon one because it's a toluene. So it's going to be a two chloral five nitro. We're going this away because one two is our lowest number sequence at our first point of difference. Go ahead and do our last one here. This is going to be carbon one, isn't it? So the nitro group's going to have to be on two. This guy's going to have to be on five. Five chloro, two nitro, all you. <coughs> And like I said, on your exam, you will have some basic nomenclature about aromatic compounds. Um, consider those three points. It's not complicated. Just remember the lowest number sequence rule, and it should be no problem. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, we talked about what benzene is. It looks like cyclohexatriene.
But what we've said so far does not explain the unusual stability. The unusual stability is something that we will call aromaticity. It has nothing to do with how it smells. When we talk about an aromatic compound, it must meet certain specifications. It must have a pi system that is conjugated and planar. Conjugated and planar. The pi system must contain 4n plus 2 electrons, where n is an integer. <clears throat> this additional stability described by Huckel is what we refer to as aromaticity. Now, if you have a system that has everything that you need here except the wrong number of electrons, that's actually called anti-aromatic. We'll see an example of that in a minute. 4n plus 2 electrons in the pi system. So let's look at our first anti-aromatic compound. Here we have cyclobutadiene. Now we look at this guy, we would expect it, well, it does have two double bonds, they are conjugated. You can write lots of little resonance structures flipping them around, but this compound is so unstable that it essentially does not exist. The reason it does not exist is that it is anti-aromatic because it has four pi electrons and that's not a magic Huckle number. Four pi electrons. Let me just show you an example here. This is dimethyl cyclobutadiene. Um, we can calculate a uh, electrostatic potential map for this. Now remember what we saw for benzene, the beautiful red circle in the middle where everybody shares. For cyclobutadienes, you don't see that. The double bonds are just sitting there by themselves and nobody shares with anybody. Very, very unhappy. Four is not a Huckle number. <coughs> Six, however, certainly is. That's benzene. Here we have two, four, six pi electrons. This is our electrostatic potential map. And again, beautiful pi cloud among all the carbons. <coughs> Let's look at cyclooctatetraene. First of all, it has eight pi electrons, two, four, six, eight. That's not a Huckle number, is it? It's also not planar. Now, as you look at it this way, you can't really tell that it's not planar. And you could easily draw this thing like a stop sign and pretend it was. But in fact, it looks like a basket. And because it looks like a basket, and because it has a long number of pi electrons, this is not an aromatic compound. There's a couple of cute ones. Oh, as you can see here, we can see uh, pi electrons, but again, it's bent, not planar, and the wrong number of electrons. This is what's called the cyclopentadienyl anion. So you take cyclopentadienyl and you pull a hydrogen off, leaving the electrons behind. Now initially those electrons would be in an sp3 orbit, but energetically it immediately hybridizes to sp squared, and these are dumped into the ring. And that gives us two, four, six pi electrons, and again this is a beautiful, stable aromatic compound. It's planar, has six pi electrons, that's a Huckle number, and it is aromatic. 
Tropilium. We've mentioned tropilium. This is one of my favorite cations. The tropilium cation. We have no electrons here for our pi system, but we have two, four, six. Putting them all together, we have a nice planar carbon cation, beautiful electron distribution, and it is aromatic. So let's just summarize what we said here. Here we have cyclobutadiene, four pi electrons, not aromatic. Benzene, six pi electrons, aromatic. Cyclooct to tetraene, eight, and not aromatic. Cyclopentadienyl anion, two, four, six, aromatic. Tropylemion, two, four, six, aromatic. Now our Huckel numbers go six, and then 10, and then 14, and then whatever. So remember, it's 2n plus 4. Or is it 4n plus 2? 4n plus 2. It's one of those. <coughs> All right, so let's look at our nucleic acid bases here. You can just leave it there. Thank you. So look at our nucleic acid bases. This is adenine and this is uracil. Are these guys aromatic? Well, if we simply look at the double bonds and we call those pi electrons, here we have two, four, six, eight. That's not a Huckel number, is it? But it is planar. However, remember, these nitrogens also have lone pairs. Now, these guys are in the ring, and these particular orbitals are sticking out orthogonal to the pi system. So that's at right angles. But this guy right here has this lone pair, and what it does is it rehybridizes from sp3 to sp2. These guys don't. But this one counts, and we have 2, 4, 6, 8. This is an aromatic compound. Uracil. I only see one double bond here, but we have two nitrogens. These are both sp3, but energetically, it's favorable for these to hybridize, rehybridize, join up with these, and make an aromatic system with six electrons. Any questions? Now here's the one that's on the exam, or was. Not going to be on your exam, because I told you. It's heme. Aromatic. We all know what heme is. Heme is the of iron-containing stuff that carries oxygen in the blood. It is as flat as it can be. That's good. How many electrons does it have? Well, let's kind of count. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, but we also have these two SPQ nitrogens. And they're going to kick in. And we wind up with 26 pi electrons, aromatic, with N equal to 6. This is one of my favorites. It's called a buckyball. Again, this is... Buckmeister Fulerine, Fulerine, um, named after the uh, geodesic domes. Uh, it takes decrease. You find it in the soil, and it has no hydrogens. But look at this thing as it goes around. Here we have six carbons in a ring. 
adjacent to five carbons in a ring. There's six more down here. The whole thing kind of looks like this. It's a soccer ball. In fact, many soccer balls use this exact pattern. And if you look at this, these six member rings, right here, that's a benzene ring. So we have C60. We have 31 double bonds. This stuff, 4n plus 2 with n equal to 15. This meets the first criteria for aromaticity. However, it's certainly not planar. It's wrapped up into a ball. Uh, it does display some properties of things that are aromatic, um, but it's actually more reactive than a simple benzene compound would be. Really cute soccer ball. Hollow in the middle. No hydrogen. Really cute. All right, consider this guy. Here we have cyclodecapentaene. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten carbons in a ring. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Now, ten high electrons is a helpful number. Is this aromatic? <coughs> The thing to think about here is, remember we have hydrogen sticking up here, in one here? Where in the world do they live? They can't live in each other's space, can they? So what happens is, one goes up, one goes down. And because of that, the thing is buckled like this, so even though it has the right number of electrons, this is not planar, but it looks like a little ball sticking up and down, and it is not aromatic. Finally, let's look at <coughs> azulene. C10, H8. We have two, four, six, eight, ten pi electrons. Yes. It meets all the criteria for being aromatic. It's planar, it has the right number of electrons. The question here is, why is it blue? Benzene is not blue. Why is this blue? You can rationalize it very simply. Looking at the resonance form. This is the two major resonance forms. We're just flipping them back and forth, no problem. But there's one more that we can do. We can take this guy, move him again, and make an anion on this end and a cation on this end. Now, why in the world would we do that? Well, because this is a cyclopentadienyl anion and this guy is a propylium cation. So this compound has a built-in huge dipole. Positive, negative, and things with dipoles like that, huge dipoles, tend to be brightly colored. So this is kind of a cute example. Any questions? Go over um, how you get the upper number again. Or upper number. Upper number 4n plus 2. Okay? And that's pi electrons. So here for ejulene, we simply look at our double bonds. We have two, one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 10 pi electrons. If n was 2, that would be a Huckle number. So Huckle numbers are 6. 10, I think 14, whatever, we go up. Um, in Agilene, because of this odd resonance, we have real high polarization, 
big negative here, big positive on this end, huge dipole, and a huge color. Now, back in the old days, the test for whether something was aromatic or not was you would draw it out, you would count the electrons, you would figure out if it was planar, whatever, whatever. These days, we use nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. This is a benzene ring. We have a pi system above, a pi system below. If we take this and we put this pi system, this compound, in a magnetic field, the magnetic field is going to affect these electrons. These are circulating electrons. It's going to affect the electrons. And it's going to set off what's called a ring current. The ring current will flow around the molecule, through the middle, and whatever, <coughs> simply from the effect of the applied magnetic field. The effect of the ring current is to induce a small magnetic field of its own. These are going to be parallel to the field and they're going to increase the chemical shift of the hydrogens. I remember we talked about benzene derivatives being way down at 7, 8, right? Simple alkenes, however, will find 6. The reason for the difference here is the ring current. Benzene itself, if we could make cyclobutadiene and U.S. NMR, it's calculated at least to be around 6. That's an alkene because this cannot support a ring current, and this guy can. Now, you know, that sounds good, but chemists like to test things, don't we? Just keep testing and testing. Turns out there's a compound that is all set up for this. It's called 18 annually. Count your pi electrons. How many do we have? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 pi electrons. Is that a Huckle number? Absolutely. So this is planar, and it's aromatic. Because it's a big ring, there's room enough for all these hydrogens to live in the middle. All right, if we take 18 annually and do an NMR, we have 12 hydrogens on the outside and 6 on the inside. That's what it looks like. See, so they all fit. A little tiny hole in the middle. Turn it sideways. See, it's nice and planar. Blah, blah, blah. Now, if we put this in a magnetic field, we're going to induce a ring current, just like we do with benzene. Ring current is going to look like this. They come around and then down through the middle. Now, just like with benzene, on this side, we're going to increase the magnetic field. But here, where they're all diving into the middle, we're going to decrease the magnetic field. So these guys are going to be high in the benzene region, and these are going to be low because we have decreased the magnetic field. If we look at the NMR spectrum, TMS, that's our standard at zero, right? Our 12 Outside hydrogens, right here in the benzene region, 7 to 8. And down here, at minus 3, this is probably the lowest chemical shift you'll ever see. Minus 3, the interior 6 hydrogens, because of the intense shielding from the ring current.
This type of shielding actually occurs quite often whenever you have high systems. Um, if you have an aldehyde, <coughs> the hydrogen of an aldehyde, aldehyde is shifted way up. That's because of the pi system and the carbonyl. The other thing that's notable here is for an alkyne. Remember, the alkyne hydrogens were really, really low. And that's because the pi system here shields them, just like in 18 annuline, not quite as much so, and pushes them down to one or two. All right, let's talk about some chemistry here. We have benzene derivatives. What can we do with them? We're going to talk about adding the benzene um, rings in just a little bit. But let's deal with side chains. The first reaction that I want to deal with is oxidation with potassium permanganate, MnO4. Permanganate is a very powerful oxidizing agent. With neutral permanganate, we can take a carbon that's attached to a benzene ring as long as it has one hydrogen in this position, the benzoic position, and we can oxidize it. We oxidize it, these all give the same compound. Basically, we're just burning off everything left with this carbon it becomes a carboxylic acid. Methyl group, carboxylic acid. These carbons are lost. This becomes the carboxylic acid. This is lost, and this is what we get. Only requirement here, we must have one hydrogen at the benzylic position. So that's adjacent to the ring. Quickly, jot down the structures you get for this. Remember, any carbon with a benzoic hydrogen is going to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid. We have two. In this case, we're going to make the 1,4 diacid. Both of these carbons here have hydrogens, so they're both going to be oxidized, <coughs> and we're going to make the 1,2 diacid. So oxidation of side chains is kind of a neat thing. If you have an alkyl group and you want to get rid of it, you can easily convert it into a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids are fine, but probably a more useful reaction is an allylic bromination. Now, if we write the benzene ring as a cyclohexatriene, the positions here that we call benzylic are the same as allylic, aren't they? We remember that allylic carbons undergo free radical halogenation very easily because they form a stable radical. So if we take n bromosuccinamide and carbon tet, maybe shine a light on it, we can take and introduce a bromine here and simply make benzyl bromide. Here we have a propyl benzene. The allylic or benzylic hydrogen is this guy. Again, NBS, a little bit of light. 
And we wind up with the uh, brominated propyl benzene product. The benzylic hydrogen here is hiding here. This tertiary carbon does have a hydrogen. It is benzylic. It will undergo free radical halogenation and give us the bromo product. Very nice reaction. The nice thing about introducing a halogen, as you remember from 234, is that once you have the halogen in, you can do lots of other chemistry with it. So it makes it a very versatile sort of reaction. Um, benzene compounds undergo this reaction very, very easily. When I was an undergraduate down in Florida. I was doing synthesis of polybenzyls. And I needed benzyl bromide. We didn't have any. So I took my little flask, volumine, a little bit of bromine, dribbled it in, went outside, sat on the stairs, bright sunlight, and just swirled it. HBR came off, and I had my stuff. Very, very nice reaction. One of the cutest reactions that you can do with the benzene ring is called the Birch reduction. This is cute because you wind up with a diene that's not conjugated. So this is a high energy state, but nonetheless, yes, this works really, really nicely. Uh, lithium metal, it's a dissolving metal reduction. Lithium metal dissolving in liquid ammonia. You can also do it with sodium. Um, Dump in benzene, and you wind up with the non-conjugated diene. Let's look at some examples here. If you put substituents on there, the birth reduction will place a double bond on the carbon attached to an electron donating substituent. So if we look at our first one here, a methyl group is electron donating. Because of that, in our product, we're going to need a double bond here. They have to be non-conjugated. Therefore, that's what you're going to get. Methoxy group. This is really big time electron donating. <clears throat> that means our double bond is here. And we wind up with this diode. Any question? All right, so here's the exam question. Quickly jot down the products for these three reactions. And our first one, assume that we have excess um, in bromo 6 centimeter. In bromo 6 centimeter, we have two benzylic carbons. If we have excess reagent, we will simply brominate on both and make the dibromo atom. We're going to simply brominate on a benzylic carbon. This is permanganate, neutral permanganate. This is going to oxidize a benzylic carbon to a carboxylic acid. So we're going to wind up with the 1,2 dicarboxylic acid. 
And finally, our birch reduction. We're going to make a diene, <coughs> electron donating groups like alkyl groups are going to be um, attached to one of the double bonds. So that means that one double bond will be here, and the other one is opposite the ring down here. Please make sure you know these very simple reactions. Um, again, we won't put these on the exam because they are nice and simple. Any questions? All right, take a deep breath. We just finished chapter 15. Chapter 16, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Now, remember last chapter, we were talking about benzene and elucidating its structure and stuff like that. And I said that it did not react with bromine like an alkene did. But you could add one bromine to the ring if you used a Lewis acid. This is electrophilic aromatic substitution. Our benzene ring, remember, has this pi system. It looks like this. Now remember what an electrophile is. Electrophile, electron loving. Something that is seeking electrons, right? If you were an electrophile and you saw this sitting there, what would you do? Where would you go? Go right for the middle here, wouldn't you? That's where the electrons are. This is how electrophilic aromatic substitution gets started. Let's start our mechanism off this way. Here's our benzene ring with this gorgeous high cloud of electrons. <coughs> I'm just going to call my electrophile E with a plus sign. It's a generic thing, generic description, E plus. So again, if you were an electrophile, where would you go? Go right for the middle here. Basically, the electrophile comes in. This is a step nobody talks about. But the electrophile comes in and sits on top of this pi system. Because you want electrons, and that's where they are. Now, this is reversible. This goes back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Once you're attached here, or once you're there, you can do the second step. This pi bond can rearrange to give a sigma bond. So imagine. <coughs> the electrophile slips off the pi cloud and just forms a bond with this carbon. So the pi complex rearranges to form the sigma complex. Now because we needed to take electrons out of the ring to do this, this thing is positive, isn't it? That's a positive charge. Our electrophile was positive, now this is positive. We can, however, delocalize this charge with simple resonance. If we put it, we start with it adjacent, we put it down here at carbon number four, and we can put it here at the other carbon number two. These are our three resonance forms for this addict. Once you do this, the next step is for this guy to lose one of these hydrogens. Loses it to a base, any base. Doesn't matter. It's going to pull this hydrogen off. The electrons are going to go back into the pi system. And we wind up with our substituted benzene. Simple, simple mechanism 
Electrophile adds to form a sigma complex, which is residue stabilized, loses the hydrogen, and you get aromatic substitution. Any question? Well, let's talk about electrophiles then. They're not just labeled keys or labeled things. <clears throat> With bromine ferric bromide, remember I said this is how you could introduce a bromine into the ring. The Lewis acid here, remember Lewis acid is an electron acceptor, will accept electrons from Br2, and when it does that, it can actually break the bromine-bromine bond to form Br+, the bromonium ion. We remember the bromonium ion from way back in chapter 3, 4, whatever, when we did additions to alkenes, remember? Bromonium ion. It's a beautiful electrophile. We can also take an alkyl halide. Now, this is bromomethane. The Lewis acid will still coordinate with the bromine. Now, the methyl group actually doesn't dissociate because that would be a methyl carbon cation. And that's really, really unstable. But it has a lot of positive character, and this end of the molecule can add as an electrophile. We'll see that this is called the fetal class reaction. If you take an acid halide, you can do the same sort of thing. Again, the bromine is going to latch into the iron. But, what have we left with on this end? A carbonyl and something else attached. What is that? Remember from mass spec. That's our acetylium ion. Very stable carbocation. This is also a Friedel Crafts acylation reaction. And this will add through the carbon to a benzene ring. The reaction that we did in class, in lab, we took nitric and sulfuric acid, mixed them together, made this hard stuff, dumped in benzene. What happened here? We formed an electrophile. We dumped in naphthalene. This was NO2 <coughs> plus. Basically, the sulfuric acid removes H2O from NHNO3 to form NO2 plus, that is our electrophile. This adds to the nitrogen to the ring. Fuming sulfuric acid. <clears throat> if you take sulfuric acid and saturate it with SO3, you get really, really nasty sulfuric acid. This is really nasty stuff. Fuming sulfuric. We can protonate the SO3, make HSO3 plus. This is our electrophile. It adds through the sulfur. So with these very simple electrophiles, we can do this. We can do halogenation. Introduce a halogen into the ring. We can do nitration. Make a nitrobenzene. We can do sulfonation. Make a benzene sulfonic acid. We can do alkylation. Fetal pass alkylation. Make an alkyl benzene. Or we can do acylation and we make a carbonyl. Very, very versatile set of reactions. Any questions? Now we're going to run through these bit by bit and talk about them. Let's start with alkylation. Again, this is our uh, electrophile complex, and it behaves just like it's Br+. 
<coughs> this is going to add to our benzene ring. Oh, instead of iron um, free bromide, you can also use aluminum bromide, aluminum chloride. They all work well as long as it's a good, happy Lewis acid. <coughs> this is our addition product. This is our electrophile Br plus added to the ring, and we have a resin stabilized carbocation. This is going to lose the hydrogen, and we wind up with a bromo benzene derivative. Very simple reaction. It works really nicely. You can also do a chlorine. Chlorine aluminum chloride or iron 3 chloride. Once again, the electrophilic addition product is simply just like this with the chlorine. <coughs> Gonna yank the hydrogen off and make the chlorobenzene. You can also put an iodine on, but with an iodine you have to cheat a little bit because the iodine is so polarizable. To do an iodine, you have to use copper to chloride. That's the only catalyst that works. But again, it's the same addition intermediate, and you wind up with the iodobenzene. So for Chlorine and bromine, just remember, um, iron 3 or aluminum. For iodine, you're going to need copper 2 chloride. Four. Sulfonate or nitration. This is the one we did. <clears throat> Again, nitric sulfuric acid. going to make NO2 plus. Um, again, the sulfuric acid sucks the water out of it. Our addition intermediate, they all look the same. Looks like this. And to get our product, all we have to do is pull off the hydrogen to get the compound. Now, on exams, I will sometimes I'll ask you for a mechanism. So if I did that in this case, I would give you these starting materials, and there would be two empty boxes. In this one, I would ask you to draw all the structure of the electrophilic addition intermediate. And in this box over here, the structure of the final product. Again, the structure of the electrophilic addition intermediate, you simply add the electrophile to the ring, leaving a positive charge. One more. Sulfonation. <clears throat> With sulfonation, we're going to make HSO3 in the fuming sulfuric acid. We're going to add through the sulfur so the electrophilic addition intermediate looks like this. And we wind up with the benzene sulfonic acid. Benzene sulfonic acids are very important compounds. Um, <clears throat> some of you probably wash your own clothing, I hope. You use detergents. Detergents are mostly sodium dodecyl sulfate. The dodecyl sulfate is a sulfonic acid. Here we have a fiddle ring. We have a long chain. Um, it's the standard, the standard detergent um, <coughs> virtually everybody uses. The Friedel Crafts alkylation. Friedel Crafts alkylation is kind of cute. It, it, again, it has a history. Friedel and Crafts were two German chemists. <clears throat> um, they were fiddling with stuff in lab. They had benzyl bromide, and they added iron-3 bromide to it. 
what happened was you get a very, very vigorous reaction that, according to the literature, they wrote these things in the literature in those days, is squirted immediately from the flask, went all over the ceiling, and they scraped the product off the ceiling. <laughs> so what happens is exactly the same thing. Our electrophile here is going to be the positive methyl group here. There's a complex, and we simply make the alkylated benzene. Friedel class alkylation is a very nice reaction. However, there are some problems. <clears throat> um, because you're using the Lewis acid, um, you cannot use um, aryl or vinyl halides. Um, if you have electron withdrawing substituents, any of these guys, it doesn't work. Sometimes we can put multiple um, methyl groups, in this case, in the ring, and this guy especially. Carbocation rearrangements can occur with primary alkyl halides. So an example of this, let's say this was exam time, and I asked you to make this. All right, you would all sit back and say, well, okay, starting with benzene, we're going to make opal benzene. We can do that with a friedel class reaction, right? So what you would do, you would react this with old propyl chloride, bromide, whatever. And we would make this carbocation. <coughs> now think about it. This is a primary carbocation adjacent to a secondary system. Remember 234? That doesn't work, does it? Because this carbocation is going to undergo rearrangement to give the most stable carbocation. In this case, it's going to be a 1,2 hydride shift, and we're going to form the propyl carbocation. Propyl carbocation is what's going to add to your ring, and that's your product. That is the long product, isn't it? However, we will see we have a clever way to make the desired product. It's going to be another 20 slides. But we'll get there. Any questions? Remember, for a Friedel class alkylation, can't use a carbon cation, it's going to rearrange because it will. All right. This is a really cute reaction involving the acylium ion. I think the acylium ion is one of the most stable carbon cations also called an oxocarbonium ion. Um, I personally did a lot of work on oxocarbonium ions, so I, I have a great attachment to them. But in this case, we take something like uh, this very simple acid bromide. We have it in the presence of a Lewis acid. When we do this, we form a small concentration of this acylium ion. This is going to add through the carbon to form this addition intermediate. We're going to lose a hydrogen and we wind up with our ketone. This is a friedel class acylation. Now, unlike the alkylation, Acylation is a little nicer sort of reaction. We do not get multiple substitutions. We do not get carbocation rearrangements. 
even if you have electron withdrawing groups, it works because this is a great electrophile. And instead of an acid chloride, you can also use an anhydride. Very simple, very versatile reaction. Any questions? Now, one of the features of my exams is reactions. I like reactions. And you might see something that looks like this. Very quickly, take and put down products for each of these reactions. Things you really need to remember from this section. Make sure for any of the common electrophiles you can draw the addition in a movie. Um, in some cases, I actually ask you to draw resonance bands, not just the thing with the dots and the plus. Draw the individual resonance bands. I haven't written your exam yet, I don't know, but you can do resonance forms, I'm sure. That's so 234. <laughs> Here our electrophile is going to be Cl plus. It's going to add to the benzene ring, form the addition intermediate. It's going to lose a hydrogen and make poor benzene. With fuming sulfuric acid, we have HSO3 plus as our electrophile. It adds through the sulfur to the benzene ring and gives the sulfonic acid. This is an acid anhydride. In the presence of a Lewis acid, we do Friedel Crafts acylation. So we're going to put an acyl group that's going to be one of these ends, like this, and that's going to attach to the benzene ring. Here we have the ketone, phenyl, ethyl, ketone. Any questions? Yeah. Does that happen every time or are there exceptions? No, this works. Okay. Yep, this works. Radial path isolation is one of the nicest reactions. I think we're actually doing one next week. We're going to isolate ferrocene, which you know nothing about either, but you will next week. All right. We know that benzene rings can have substituents on them. If you already have a substituent, <coughs> you can still do electrophilic aromatic substitution. What you have to figure out, though, is where the electrophile is going to add. So substituents are going to control the reactivity of the ring. We will have things we call activating and things we call deactivating. And they're also going to control the regiochemistry. That is, where the electrophile adds. If we look at our R group, remember our nomenclature of ortho, meta, and para. We will have one group of substituents that will push the electrophile ortho and para, and we'll have another group that will push the electrophile meta. So let's look at this. <clears throat> First of all, let's talk about 
activated versus deactivated rings. Remember we looked at benzene and had this gorgeous little circle of electrons that was as happy as it could be, it looked nice and comfortable, right? Well, we can add substituents that can actually push more electrons into the ring. More electrons you have, the more reactive it's going to be. Anyway, here's an example of that. The amino group, by resonance, can push electrons in. This is benzonitrile, carbon oxygen <coughs> triple bond. It is very electron withdrawing. It's going to basically suck electrons out of the ring. So let's start with benzene. Nice, big, happy pi system, lots of electrons. We put the nitrogen on here. Again, the lone pair by resonance can push electrons in. And if we look at the electrostatic potential map, you see we have really enhanced the electron density in our way. This is an activating substituent. More electrons, that's good. The nitrile group, however, sucks them out. And if we look at that electrostatic potential map, we see that all the electrons are sucked up here, and this is really electron deficient. So this is going to be very slow to react, this will react very quickly. We will call these activating and deactivating substituents. Here's our selection. We just saw aniline, aminobenzene, phenol. These guys, you know, we have a, an unshared pair of electrons that are pushing electrons in by resonance. <clears throat> the amide, we also have some. We'll talk about why in the world a methyl group is activating, but it is. All alpha groups are. Down here, we have things that withdraw electrons. Halogens, um, carbonyls, sulfonic acids, nitro groups, and nitrile, we saw this. These all withdraw and they become deactivated. So these are more reactive than benzene, and these are less reactive than benzene. This isn't difficult. <coughs> um, the more electrons you have, the more reactive you will be with electrophilic aromatic substitution. So let's look at one example here. This is anisole, methoxybenzene. I can remember some time in my life I wrote an exam question where I asked people to write <coughs> the resonance forms for something like anisole to show the electron density in the ring. Now I'm sure you can all do that. In order to do this, we're going to take one of these electron pairs and move it in. <coughs> that will give us too many here, so we have to move one pair out. And we would get this as our first resonance form. Remember, resonance forms are like limits. Remember calculus and have limits? You never get there, do you? But you never get to a resonance form either. It's a limit. And all this tells you is that this carbon is going to have anionic character. Now we can move this again. Move these guys in, move these guys out. And do it again. Move them in, move them out. And what we've done here is we have wound up with extra electron density at the ortho and the para carbon. Nothing at the metal, but ortho and para. If we looked at the resonance hybrid, it would look something like this. We would have 
partial negative charges on these three carbons. So this is how the methoxy group is pushing electrons into the ring. This is why it is so reactive. All right. This is what we just did. Remember I said that a substituent would control the regiochemistry, right? So if you have an electrophile and it's going to add to a benzene ring, if you were an electrophile, where would you add? Well, you'd probably go for the ortho or para positions, right? That makes sense. What I did, I, I have this computer program that will allow me to calculate an electrostatic potential mass. And I did that for methoxybenzene. It looks something like this. Now remember, this, this, and this are the carbons where we expect all this negative charge. All right, I kind of was a little puzzled. So I thought, I'm going to do nitrobenzene. Nitrobenzene is really electron withdrawing. And by resonance, it will place positive charges at the ortho and para carbons. <coughs> so I thought, let me do the electrostatic potential map here. And so I did. Now, hi George, I looked at these and I said, all right, well there are fewer electrons in this ring than this one, but I frankly see no difference in any of these carbons. Frankly, I did not, and I was very disappointed because I expected to see big red blobs here and big blue blobs here. Remember, red means electrons, blue is positive charge. That's what I expected to see, and I didn't. So I was puzzled. And then it occurred to me that I'm asking the wrong question here. The reason that we're going to get addition like we do doesn't have to do so much with where the electrons are pushed or pulled from, but from the intermediate. Remember the intermediate in these reactions looks like this. We have an electrophile that added. We are stabilizing the charge by resonance all around the ring. Okay? So what I did is I took this guy and I did the electrostatic potential map. So this is, this is actually a bromine sticking out. <clears throat> but this is the electrostatic potential map of a bromine adding to the ring. This is an sp cube carbon, one of these guys. Now, if you take this and turn it upside down, look at the bottom, this is what you see. <clears throat> now we can see a difference between the carbons. <clears throat> the carbons that are ortho and para have positive charges. So, if we want to form a stable intermediate here, what we want is a substituent at these positions that's going to stabilize the positive charge. So we don't really care about the ground state. What's really happening here is we're stabilizing this intermediate.
if we stabilize the intermediate, that also stabilizes the transition state. Remember the transition state is the energy you have to go through to get there. To stabilize it is forward. And therefore that reaction happens faster. <coughs> so the bottom line here is that electron donating substituents or the one parent to our addition stabilize this intermediate and make this reaction go. All right, so let's look at this in terms of real reaction. Again, it has less to do with pumping electrons in than stabilizing the transition state. All right, if we take toluene and we dump it into nitric sulfuric acid, as our electrophile, we will generate NO2 plus. The methyl group, we remember, I said, was electron releasing. We'll talk about that, why, but it is. It's electron releasing. Therefore, if we add our nitro group ortho or para to the methyl, the methyl is going to be stabilizing that intermediate. So our prediction is we should get ortho para products and virtually no meta substitution. The bottom line here is things that can pump <coughs> electrons into a benzene ring are going to direct the substitution ortho and para to themselves. Ortho and para to themselves. Electron donating substituents, ortho and para. <coughs> Going back to our chart, that means we can now classify this entire group here all of these can pump electrons in by resonance. These are all going to be ortho para direct. <clears throat> Electron releasing ortho para. Any question? Now let's go and let's talk about our methyl group here. Because, you know, it's the only one here that doesn't obviously have electrons. It can release by resonance. It's a funny thing, funny concept, but again, it's something you learned in 234, whether you know it or not. It's called hyperconjugation. Now remember when you talked about carbocations. Somebody told you that a primary carbocation was very unstable, but a tertiary carbocation was much, much more stable. You remember that. You can confirm that by looking at the electrostatic potential maps. Remember, blue is positive. Here we have a big honking blue carbon, and we put methyl groups around it. And this thing really, really has much less charge. Now, how in the world is this happening? Again, it's called hyperconjugation. <coughs> if we look at our primary carbocation here, in hyperconjugation, what you do is you're going to stabilize this by taking the electrons from one of the CH bonds move them in, make a, quote, double bond, and you just leave this poor hydrogen hanging out here to dry. I remember these are limits, so this doesn't really happen. Don't worry about the hydrogen. It's a limit, but we can do this with all three hydrogens, and the more alkyl groups we have, the more we can do it. 
What we really have is a carbon where all the hydrogens have slightly positive charges, and they help neutralize this carbon cation. That's the concept of hyperconjugation. Any questions? All right, we talked about things pumping electrons in. Let's take electrons out. <clears throat> we looked at benzonitrile. This is a powerful electron withdrawing group. It's going to suck electrons out of the ring. <clears throat> if we do nitration, we see only 17 and 2 percent orthopara, but we see 80 percent or so meta substitution. The bottom line here is going to be that things that withdraw electrons are going to push substitution meta to themselves. That's going to be our bottom line. But let's look and see why this happens. Let's take our benzonitrile and add our generic electrophile. I'm going to add it to the meta position. Okay? Here we go. Now, we're going to stabilize this carbocation by resonance. And we're going to flip electrons around. Flip them again, and we wind up with three, these three resonance structures. Resonance hybrid, something like that. We have put positive charge at the ortho and para positions relative to the nitride. Okay, everyone see that? Simple, simple, <coughs> 234 <coughs> resonance argument. Let's do the same thing now, except let's add it to the pair of position. Once again, we're going to delocalize our electrons. <coughs> do it again. And we have these three resonance forms. A hybrid would look like this. So if we add to the para position, we would put positive charge <coughs> ortho and para to our electrophile. Your question is, we have two resonance hybrids. Which is the worst one? One of these is better than the other. Well, here we put a positive charge right next to our electron withdrawing group. That's a bad thing. This is a bad thing. Therefore, this is going to be higher energy than this one. So why do we push, so why do we put substituents meta? to an electron withdrawing group, because these are bad. These are the only two positions we have that can react. Therefore, we do. It's going to be slow, but these are the positions we're going to add to. So let's complete our table. <clears throat> Here we go. We've already said that these guys up here, things that donate electrons, are going to be orthoparadirecting. These guys at the bottom that withdraw electrons are going to be meta-directing. So if I give you a problem where you have a substituted benzene and you're going to do electrophilic addition, you simply Visualize your little table here. You say, is it electron donating 
overflowing. If it's donating, it's going to go over para. If it's withdrawing, it's going to go meta. That's the bottom line. Let's do some reactions then. Go ahead and quickly jot these down. That one, when you look at the substituent, you say, is that electron <coughs> donating or withdrawing? Well, it's a methyl group, so it's donating. That means our electrophile here is chlorine. It's going to go ortho or para to the methyl group. <coughs> On an exam, you can choose either one. <coughs> Typically, you get more ortho, I'm sorry, more para because putting things here gets a little crowded. <coughs> Our next guy is a sulfonic acid. Visualize your table. Sulfonic acids were way down at the bottom, weren't they? That's electron withdrawing. That means it's going to direct meta. Our electrophile here is simply bromine. So we're going to get the free bromo benzene sulfonic acid. Now remember, iodine, copper two fluoride. That's our one exception. You have to remember that because I always put the odd ones on the exam. We have a nitro group. Nitro group. Very powerful electron <coughs> group. That means it's going to direct meta to itself. This is simply going to give us the meta iodo nitrobenzene. <laughs> yeah. When we're directing it and someone better pair, are we looking at the one that's on the benzene? Yep. Or are we looking at the one that's on the benzene? Yep. This is going to direct where the electric bar is. Everybody happy with these? Mm -hmm. And I'll be quiet, and you can do three more.
Our first one here, we're dealing with toluene. We are doing a chlorination. CO plus is our electrophile. We are activating ortho and para. That's what we get. Sulfonic acid, we're brominating. We're going to brominate the meta. It's electron withdrawing. Oops. And this guy. Here we have isopropyl benzene. The isopropyl group is electron donating, just like a methyl is. So this is going to direct ortho and para to itself. This is a Friedel class acylation, isn't it? That means that we are going to put carbonyl group and the five-member ring onto our benzene ring. Once again, it's going to go either ortho or para. Ortho is going to be a little clouded. So probably the best compound you can get would be this guy. Again, we put our carbonyl directly to the ring, and the five-member ring just goes along for the line. Any question? Yeah. So let's say you don't remember the table on a test or quiz. And you should remember it. And you have like the periodic table. Is there any way to uh, not really? Not really? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. The, the simple rule of thumb is if you have a substituent on a benzene ring that can donate electrons by resonance. So anything with extra electrons. <coughs> Halogen, oxygen, nitrogen, anything like those can dump it in by resonance. Those are all going to be activated. Things that we can, and of course, you have to remember how to do Everything else, the sulfonic acids, the nitriles, nitro groups, are going to be electron withdrawing, and they'll be that. So just one more left. All right, what if we have more than one substituent here? <clears throat> now, based on the, what I just said, here we have an oxygen. Oxygen's going to have extra electrons. This is going to be activating, and it's going to direct ortho and para, right? Alkyl group also is activating and also directs ortho para. So for the methoxy, we would expect to put something there. The methyl, we would expect to put something there. Now is when you actually need to remember your table because they're arranged in order of activation. In general, anything with really long pairs that can stick it in are going to win. Therefore, this bromination is going to go directed by the most powerful group. And we should get this bromobenzene. Most powerful group should dominate. <coughs> Look at another one. <clears throat> All right. Both of these are going to direct ortho and para, aren't they? This has extra electrons. This is an alkyl group. So our methyl group, we're going to push it here, here, and here. Chlorine is going to push it here, here, and here. There are, in this case, three possible isomers you could get. Clearly, we're not going to get substitution here, are we? That's not going to work. But we could get this compound, 
we could get this compound, or we could get this one. Now, this one actually doesn't form because there's just not enough room to put everything together. But theoretically, it could happen. <coughs> now, on the exam, we're not going to do disubstituted compounds, but just remember the most powerful group is going to dominate. All right, we have just done electrophilic aromatic substitution. There's another type called nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And it looks like this. If we take fluorodinitrobenzene and we dump this into base, hydroxide, Product of this reaction is the phenol. All right. Hydroxide is an anion. It's not acting as an electrophile, is it? So let's see if we can figure out what's happening here. We talked about Nucleophilic reactions back in 234, where you did like SN2 displacements, SN1 displacements, whatever. If this was an SN2, it would require a backside attack, wouldn't it? That's what you do in an SN2 reaction. That's impossible. No way you can get in opposite this carbon because of the whole pi system this year. So that's not going to work. We can rule out the SN2 mechanism. In an SN1 mechanism, you formed an intermediate carbocation and then added the nucleophile. However, this is one of the worst carbocations you could ever imagine. Nitro groups withdraw electrons like mad. And we're going to make an arrow cation? That's not going to happen. It's a terrible carbocation. So we can rule out SN1 and SN2. What we're left with is called addition elimination. You'll note that this ring is very electron deficient. <clears throat> First of all, fluorine itself, over here, is very <coughs> electronegative, the most electronegative element. So it's sucking electrons towards itself. The nitro groups by resonance are pulling all the rest away. So this ring is really, really positive. Here we have hydroxide, and it's negative. Sometimes chemistry can be very simple. All that happens here is that hydroxide is going to attack, and we're going to form this addition in a medium. Now this is anionic, but the nitro group can easily take care of the anion by delocalizing the electrons out on its oxygens. Once we have, well here we're going to do that, I think. So here we have our oxygens on our nitro group. If we simply move these in, move these out, we get this resonance form. So our, our vanion now becomes an oxyanion. Very stable. Nitro groups, really good at doing this. So this is our addition intermediate. In order to form our product, all we have to do is move these electrons back and let the fluorine go. And here we go. <clears throat> this is our elimination step. I 
addition, elimination. Hydrophilic, it only happens on rings that are really electron deficient, and you need a good, strong nucleophile to do this. Hydroxide, lots of electron, good, strong base, good <coughs> nucleophile. It adds to the ring, addition, and then elimination. Probably the most important thing I want you to remember out of this is this. Make sure you understand how a nitro group can delocalize a negative charge. Once again, it takes it from the carbon ion and makes it an oxy anion. Carbon ions are unstable. Oxy anions are much, much better. Any All right, let's go ahead and look at some reactions of side chains. Now, we've already seen some. <clears throat> we saw that we could um, oxidize them with permanganate, we can do allylic formation. Um, there are a couple more that are actually useful. Remember when we talked about benzene itself, we said that benzene was very slow to undergo reduction. Now you can use that to your advantage. Because if we had like a double bond here, this is styrene. If we had a double bond and we wanted to get rid of it, we can selectively reduce it. All you need is standard reduction conditions of hydrogen, platinum on charcoal, root count. <clears throat> you can reduce this to the ethyl group without touching the benzene ring. So that's nice. You can do that. That's a nice, simple reaction. <clears throat> benzene ring, under these conditions, does not react uh, very fast at all. We can change our conditions. If we take this up to 200 pounds per square inch, warm it up, <clears throat> we can reduce both the ring and the double bond. You probably don't want to be doing this reaction. <coughs> High pressure reactions are difficult. Uh, there's also a really neat thing that was discovered a number of years ago, and this is the property of rhodium. Rhodium is a really interesting catalyst. At room temperature, one atmosphere, you can reduce the benzene ring just like, well, just like that. You reduce both of them, but again, this requires a rhodium catalyst. Any questions? We talked about putting Nitro group on a ring. <coughs> Nitro groups aren't really very useful, but you can reduce it to an amine. This is aniline, and that's a very, very useful compound. Putting a nitro group on is very easy. Simply do a simple reduction, and you wind up with the aniline derivative. There are two ways to do it. You can actually do it with catalytic um, hydrogenation, with platinum, palladium, or charcoal. This is the typical one. Um, tin 2 chloride um, in acid works just really nicely. I don't quite know why, but um, these are the preferred reactants. And again, it goes from nitro to the amino group. And this is one of the really neat ones, really useful ones. If we have a methyl ketone, I'm sorry, an alkyl ketone, an aryl ketone, we can smoothly reduce that, either <coughs> catalytically, and nobody does it this way, or you could do it with a dissolving metal reaction with zinc, mercury, amalgam, and acid. 
And this reaction even has a cute story to go with it. Dissolving metal reductions. If you remember back to 234, um, you have your compound, um, aqueous acid, you add metal, and it fizzes. The fizzing gives or produces hydrogen radicals. And these guys then can reduce things. Okay, remember that from 234. Well, somebody, I don't remember who, was trying to do this with an aryl ketone and was doing <coughs> zinc and acid. Added it, zinc dissolves, but nothing happened. The carbonyl did not produce. The guy had a thermometer down in the class and was stirring it with the thermometer. There's zinc metal in here, so he's stirring it, stirring it, stirring it. Nothing's happening, he's not happy. And he stirred it too hard. And the thermometer broke. Well, that was a mercury thermometer in those days. The mercury went down into the zinc form this amalgam, and poof, the reaction took off. Zinc mercury amalgam in acid, wonderful for converting an aryl ketone to a simple CH2 group. Now, why is that so useful? <coughs> Remember, not too long ago, I asked you to take benzene and make propyl benzene, right? We said we couldn't do this because the carbocation cation would rearrange. And we would make the isopropyl benzene instead. But if we take benzene and we do a fetoplast acylation, we can make this compound. Now, all you have to do is take this little guy, dump it into zinc mercury amalgam, <coughs> and you have your propyl benzene. Very useful reaction. Pheoplast acylation is a good reaction. Um, once you have the carbonyl, you can do lots of chemistry on it. We'll talk a lot about carbonyl chemistry later in the semester. But if you simply want to get rid of it, this is a very nice way to do that. Any questions? All right, 235 is the course where you are going to be introduced to real organic synthesis. Real organic synthesis. You might have done a little bit in 234, but as we go through this course, we can develop methods to do multi-step reactions. So let's just look at one based on the chemistry that we've done today. What if I tell you I'm going to give you benzene, and I want you to make 4-bromo-benzoic acid. Your entire grade in 235 depends on you doing this. When you do a synthesis, a multi-step synthesis, what you do is you don't look at what you're starting with. You're allowed to peek at it. That's it. You can peek at it. But what you do is you look at your product. And you ask yourself, what is it? How do I know how to make it? And then work backwards a step. So let's start with our product. We have to introduce a bromine and a carboxylic acid. We know that we can do a carboxylic acid by oxidation of an alkyl group, right? That's for We've done that. 
And we know we can do brom or introduce a bromine by bromine ferric bromide. So that's how we're going to put these things on. <coughs> so this carboxylic acid used to be a methyl. So our last step in this synthesis could have been something like this, where we took four bromotoluene and we simply did an oxidation. So that's the last step in our synthesis. Now we have a new synthesis problem. You remember that we were starting with benzene. Somehow we have to make 4 bromo toluene Now, what do we know about 4 bromo toluene <coughs> Both the bromine and the methyl groups are orthopara directing, aren't they? So we could have made this, starting with toluene, and sticking on a bromine group. How would you do that? Simply the bromination of toluene with bromine and iron bromide. Now we have a new synthesis problem. We're starting with benzene, and we need to make toluene. How do we do that? Well, we're adding a methyl group, aren't we? That's a friedel crafts alkylation. So we're simply going to take benzene, and we're going to alkylate it. Going to use something like iron three bromide and bromomethane or aluminum chloride. And we have done one of the synthetic pathways. Now, the beauty of this is that you can do this two ways. There's another pathway to make this guy, starting with benzene. Take just a minute and see if you can figure it out. How would you make 4 bromo toluene starting with benzene? Well, yeah, you could. Yeah, this could be a bromomethane, iron 3 4 or bromine. That would work perfectly fine. Yeah, they all work. To get this guy, instead of using toluene, we could have simply taken bromobenzene and added the methyl group. Again, bromobenzene has electrons to share with the ring, so it is orthopara directing. Adding our methyl group is just our friedel crafts reaction. Therefore, we could do this. <coughs> and finally, how do we make our bromobenzene? Simply brominate benzene, bromine, iron 3 bromide. Now, on your first exam, I'm not going to give you a multi-step synthesis like this. But I assure you that by the time we hit chapter 20, a three or four step synthesis is going to seem like nothing to you. It's going to seem like nothing. You're going to look at it and say, I can do that. You just have to think backwards.
Any questions? All right, so we made it through chapters 15 and 16. On the next Tuesday, we are going to do Trito Crafts um, Nitration. No, Isolation, I think. Um, Pharisee. That's an organic metallic compound. Um, on Tuesday. Let's see. Oh, on Tuesday. <coughs> Um, your sample exam, I will give a sample exam, will go up on Blackboard. <clears throat> on Thursday, we will go over the sample exam in class, answer any questions. When you print your sample exam, take two copies, <coughs> and then one, and I get you extra credit on the exam. 10 points. Okay? All right. So have a good evening. We made it. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I just have a question. How, um,